Hello there. Welcome back to coverage here at Grand Prix Atlanta. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe in the booth with Jacob Van Loon, and our players are all set here for round number seven. We've got Eric Hawkins. He's playing against Steve Rubin. Taking a look at the deck list here, Jake, and I see Servant of the Conduit, Rogue Refiner, Rolo Virtuosco, and Long Tusk Cub for Steve Rubin. I wonder what he's playing. I believe he's probably playing Team Around. I think you might be right. Now, on the other side of the table, though, we've got a different take on the format here. This is the white-blue tokens in the hands of Eric. What do you see in from uh, white-blue here? So I've played against this, this deck a few times online. This is a procession deck, or what is it? Yeah, yeah, So the deck plays Anointed Procession. Okay. And then it plays a whole lot of creatures that, you know, have the ability to embalm. So then, like, you're playing cards like Sacred Cat, and when you embalm your Sacred Cat, you get two tokens. You know, you have Vizier Many Faces, Anointer Priest, Angel of Sanctions, all these cards that do that, and you just kind of, you know, take the game over over the course of the game. And it, it, it's a more advanced version of what's This is on. an important play early here, Jake. Uh, Steve, with, with only one energy available, actually didn't have an attack with the Long Tusk Cub, but he used up that energy uh, for an Aether Hub to cast a Rogue Refiner, which gave him that critical second energy so that he actually did have a profitable attack into the two. Yes, I'm about to say this, sacred cats on the <laughs> battlefield. And yeah, that's super important there. And uh, Eric, obviously blocking there, can't let Steve Rubin pick up extra energy to make that long cusk cup more of a threat than it already is. Here's a Noiner Priest now from Eric. He does not have the untapped mana available to bring back sacred cat this turn, which would get him <laughs> some life. But I, yeah, I'm still having a hard time getting used to seeing cards like Noiner Priest and sacred cat on the battlefield. But they certainly do serve uh, an important role in this deck and, and in other decks that you see them in as well. Uh, we saw them in the hands of Pascal Minard last weekend in that blue-white uh, Godfaro's Gift deck where cards like Sacred Cat did some serious work for him. Absolutely. They can make the games go long enough that you can just take over and have inevitability with cards like Godfaro's Gift. And uh, Eric Hawkins, instead of using Godfaro's Gift, is using um, Anointed Procession. So now every time he returns one of these sacred cats, he gets two. Meow. All right, he's going to go ahead and use Harness Lightning to just take down the Anointer Priest here and then send in with both the Rogue Refiner and the Long Tusk Cub. He also took care to cast that uh, Servant of the Conduit in his first main phase so that he got the energy available in case he'd like to sink some of it into this Long Tusk Cub. Yeah, and Steve Rubin really recognizing his role in this matchup. He's the aggressor here. He needs to be attacking. Um, you know, he just wants to deal as much damage as fast as possible to Eric Hawkins because if Eric Hawkins gets to play that anointed procession and untap, the game is going to become really difficult for Steve Rubin to win. You can see that Hawkins has fallen significantly behind on board here. But he's got a Vizier of Many Faces that he's going to cast. That's going to copy Rogue Refiner get him a card and uh, some energy I think he's pretty unlikely to use. But uh, that does give him a blocker and perhaps a play for next turn as well. Yeah, he can't be thrilled with that. When on turn four you're tapping all your mana and you're passing the turn behind on the board, it's a pretty bad sign against team or energy because when they get ahead, especially at this stage of the game, it's really, really hard to come back in and take it back. Oof. Yeah, so... Glorybringer is well, going to take out the Rogue Refiner. <laughs> yeah, Rogue Refiner down, and Glorybringer is going to clear the way for a massive hit here. It is 11 damage. No, it's 9. But, uh, yeah, that is plenty, and Eric Hawkins' life total is plummeting quickly here. If Steve chose to uh, save that energy and not use it the long tusk have this turn that leads to believe and probably leads Eric Hawkins to believe that he has a card like World of Virtuoso in hand. Some place to put that mana, or excuse me, that energy later. Hawkins yeah. doesn't really have the luxury at this point of thinking too much about what's in Steve Rubin's hand. He has plenty enough to deal with on the board <laughs> itself. <laughs> That's absolutely true. That's Champion Witch, which is essentially just a chump blocker here. Yep. He's going to discard another copy of Sacred Cat and a Sunscourge Champion as well. So he may be able to get that back in a little while. Gosh, it's just, th this game, you know, to me has really shown a lot of the, uh, 
the downside of playing a deck like this when you don't have your signature card, when you don't have the anointed procession going, these cards just seem utterly fair and underpowered compared to what the Teamer Energy deck is doing. Yeah, and you know, they're giving him a lot of time. You know, he's going to get to block again. It seemed, you know, most decks after they took the beating they took the turn before would just be dead here. And Sayer Cats are going to allow him to live longer. But, you know, you're just delaying the inevitable at this point because you know, you're going to have to spend a whole turn, basically, using that Anointed Procession. Steve's going to cast a uh, Whirler Virtuo, so he did have to use yet another energy on the hub. He still doesn't have a blue mana source to his, uh, at his disposal, but thankfully that Ether Hub has done a fine job, and his energy levels have stayed quite high anyway. And uh, as you were speculating a minute ago there, Jake, there's that Whirler Virtuoso, and he even has enough energy to make two Thopters. And currently, Eric, not doing anything in the air. Yeah, that, that Glory Bringer in conjunction with those Thopters could end this game very quickly. Yeah, and Eric has uh, real problems here going. Now, the interesting thing, too, for Steve is, does he have attacks here? And if so, with what? There is four power on the other side of the battlefield in very willing blockers here for Eric. You know, I think Steve certainly wants to be getting in with the Cub. Uh, the Rogue Refiner, it's less obvious, but you know the Servant almost certainly not getting in. He needs that access to a fifth mana in case he draws another copy of Glorybringer. Or if he wants to leave up two mana to cast a card like Harness Lightning. So Eric's going to go for maximum blocking here. He's going to trade off for the Rogue Refiner and soak up the damage from the Cub, keeping him at 10 and in fact going to 11. And... Uh, Well, I don't think he's at 1. I believe he's at 11. <laughs> yeah, there we go. But that was a turn that Ruben needed just to sort of clear away the chaff on the ground. But next turn is when the big hitters come and uh, knock Eric's life total perhaps to, to zero. So Eric really has to have a, a powerful turn here. Main priorities, kill, kill a glory bringer slash cast blocker? Yeah. Like, how is he getting so out of this? Angel of Sanctions is a card that is in his main deck, and that card would do pretty well here, mm. at, you know, removing a glory bringer and providing a big blocker. The problem is, I think Steve Rubin may have Essence Scatter in hand for the complete and total blowout. Ooh. If that does end well, up we're going to find out, because he definitely you know, like, is just cast Angel of Sanctions. <laughs> and that's, like, the perfect card for Eric Hawkins in this situation. The only card that can get him back into this game, basically. <laughs> Steve Rubin does have the Essence wow, Scatter. Wow, there's so the Essence like Scatter. What a beating. You know, another, of course, card, though, that we have to remember from Eric's deck is Fumigate, right? That, that's a card that <clears throat> would certainly get him right back into this game as well. Oh, he's, he's definitely, he is, oh, he is playing Fumigate. Yeah, I think okay. he's got three or maybe? Yeah, he yeah. does have three. So, you know, th th that's the kind of type of card that that's what it's for. Right, yeah. and, and Steve, you know, is kind of going, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And then he's like, Angel of Sanctions? As Steve looks down at his essence scatter, and it's like, okay, we did it. Yeah, that's the, the perfect one to have in that spot. Is he deciding if he wants to make Thopters here? He's deciding whether or not Thopters change the, the racing math. You know, Steve does have uh, Planeswalkers in his deck, which are you know, really strong against the uh, the Fumigate plan. He also has a main deck, Sky Sovereign, console flagship, which is great against the Fumigate plan. Yeah, we've seen people substitute out some number of glory bringers for Sky Sovereign uh, here and there in standard. It's just a really well-positioned card right now. And, you know, so many people are fighting battles on the ground that having that six power flyer to, you know, punch through points of damage can be really, really valuable. As we see here, if, if there was a Sky Sovereign involved, it would be taking over the game quite easily. Seven energy in the bin here for Ruben, who is going to go ahead and attack just with the three top creatures, leaving back the uh, Servant of the Conduit once again. Again, presumably because he has something he wants to cast with it. And he has, uh, you know, a nice he mix does. of answers in his deck. He has another long tusk come. Oh, so he's using that for that. Well, it's kind of fumigator bust at this point for Hawkins. 
his deck has just played uh, an utterly fair deck. As an utterly fair deck, I mean, I don't think the Angel of Sanctions is even enough at this point, right? No. I mean, this. I think if he doesn't have Fumigate, this game is over. This game, his deck has played out as, you know, the best draft deck ever. <laughs> as a mediocre draft deck with a really good bomb. Yeah. <laughs> but when you're, you're viziering a uh, rogue refiner on your turn four in a deck that can't use energy doesn't feel good. No. No, and it didn't work out well for him. That glory bringer just squashed that rogue refiner right away. It's a matchup that he's probably happy about for game one, too, so. Yeah, a big part of that, of course, being Fumigate, as it is quite good against team or energy. They are a heavily creature-based deck, and they just have to commit. Uh, you know, one of the ways that they can get around it is if they can get Long Tusk Cub going early, but Eric's deck is exceptionally good at preventing that. He, he has the ability to just chump block with these cats or these... Uh, yeah, anointer priest or whatever, yeah, and, and just you. I mean, and, and by the way, that has happened here. That that long tusk cub is still yet to actually get in, <laughs> you know, meaningfully. And Steve hasn't even bothered to put any counters on it as well, probably with that in mind. All right, so Sun Scourge Champion is going to come back and gain him four, put him back up to ten, and I guess he's discarding a sacred cat to it, which he's immediately going to bring back. So. Well, I guess this is what happens when you draw all four of your sacred uh, cards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Keep it going. So now Ruben needs to do the math, but if he doesn't have a way to get rid of the blockers, you know, once again, we're still waiting for the Glorybringer turn, uh, you know, from Ruben. Yeah. And by that time, you know, Eric will have more to prolong the game. Maybe Fumigate. Perhaps we're, uh, we're counting him out too early here because he continues to find himself ways to get additional draw steps. Here, Steve's going to have to figure out whether or not it's worth it to make Doctor Tokens. It's probably not. You probably just want to be able to make those Cubs into 5-5s five potentially so that they can uh, win a fight with that champion on the other side of the table. Yeah, Eric lives in uh, Minnesota, and he had been playing on the Star City Tour for a while but has recently started to focus on Grand Prix, and in fact, his goal is to make it to the Pro Tour. He also played against Steve Rubin at one of those star cities where Eric won and even made the top eight of the event. Ooh. But he also thinks that Steve is going to avenge his loss here at the <laughs> GP level. So this is Steve Rubin's revenge match? It is. Or is it? We will find out shortly. Yeah. Right now, he's been doing a good job of keeping the heat on Hawkins. He may have found himself a new nemesis here. If Eric loses, he found himself a new nemesis. Mm -hmm. It's the nemesis maker of a match. <laughs> Steve, uh, <laughs> of course, was our Pro Tour Shadows over Innistrad champion, playing green-white tokens. So he knows a thing or two about how token decks work in general. He has yet to win a GP. Uh, he's got two finals appearances, but has, has yet to actually take one down. All right, so he's decided that this attack is correct. Bristling Hydra pre-combat. Get the energy. Put him up to nine. There we go. And then jam with everything else that can attack. The Glorybringer just came off of Exert, so it can't at the moment. Yeah, so with this attack, I believe Steve is forcing Eric's hand and making him block both Cubs. Yeah. This would have him hitting for seven. Yeah, Eric's going to gain one, so he'll stay mm -hmm. four, but... That's right. But then you're <laughs> looking at that glory bringer. Yeah. And Eric really needs to draw Fumigate on this next turn or the game just ends. If he does draw Fumigate, though, he's just going to gain a healthy seven life off of it. He would actually go to one with this block as well. Okay, so... Yeah, Ruben can six, use up eight energy, six, hit for ten, but he gets one from lifelink. That's true. 
I, <laughs> it yeah, is I, risky I business to say the market, least, but, but yeah. Eric has to be thinking about Fumigate the entire time. I mean, so is Steve. But Eric is just like, come on, just the once. Looks like he's decided to uh, go ahead and chump the Long Tusk Cub anyway. And Ruben is going to cash in four energy for two counters, which will allow him to save his Long Tusk Cub, or at least trade. And uh, it looks like he's content to trade. Interesting. So those two energy are worth more to him than that Long Tusk Cub body. I suppose his thinking is that Fumigate's basically the only card that matters at this point. Yeah. But that is interesting, especially on five, when you can go down to three. And still have activations here, two other cards. Yeah. Right. It, I would be surprised if he didn't just save the Long Tusk Cub. Yeah, it looks like that's what he's going to do. Although also worth noting that you know he d the only blue mana he has access to is off of Servant of the Conduit and Ether Hub. So, mm -hmm. you know True. that True. energy reserve. Oh, is here we go, Fumigate one time. He says, <sighs> Ooh, "It was a, a land." land. <laughs> <laughs> so Eric Hawkins, even though he's packing three main deck Fumigate, plays a pretty prolonged game against Steve Rubin, who had just sort of the usual suspects from uh, Teamer Energy and still could not find himself a copy of Fumigate and that did it. Steve Rubin is going to win game number one. Yeah, take a look at our feature match here. You get a little Noah Walker back there. He's playing against Petr Sahurik there. I see Chris Larson is bat battling Alexander Hain on our back table. Can't quite get a view on the other one, but... Good day for magic here in Atlanta. A little cloudy. Yeah, a little bit chilly. But not bad. Yeah, cooler than one might expect in Atlanta. Definitely. Yeah. I thought uh, Georgia, you know, you think peaches. I think sunshine, I I'll tell you that. Yeah. It was colder here than it was in Seattle. But it was raining in Seattle, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, in the Pacific during the winter, mm -hmm. it's, you know, you get the warm current along the shore, and then right? during the summer you get the cold current along the shore, which is why it's more temperate oh, around Seattle. I didn't Whereas, know that. you know, around here, you, we get the warm current in the summer, and then we get the colder current in the winter. So, it so we have more extreme out? winters. It just doubles and down? Then, <laughs> and then more extreme summers. Yeah, I did not know like that. Georgia. I mean, I knew yeah. that it was hotter, but yeah. I did not know that was why. Wow. JVL, you really did prep for this event. <laughs> <laughs> So I've played against this blue-white, uh, like, token deck a couple times online this okay, week. Okay, yeah. What's your take um, on it? Well, I'd never seen it before the first time I played it. It just absolutely demolished me. I've been playing red this week. Oh, and geez. Yeah, and wow, it was, it's all sacred cats and Yeah, and champions. I'm playing four Ferocid on main. I, I mean, I wasn't drawing them with any sort of consistency against them when I did. Uh -oh, they were getting cast out. Oh, right into a bad beat story. No, it's not a bad beat story. <laughs> but, but I think the deck does have good longevity. Uh-huh. Um, uh -huh. I think people are, you know, often playing the game against the token deck as if it's a Godfather's gift deck. Like when you play an energy deck, they're like, "Oh, you're on you're Pascal's deck." Exactly. Oh, interesting. And uh, as a result, the deck does get a lot of free wins off of Fumigate because people aren't playing around it. Uh, the deck gets, uh, you know, just a lot of wins by being, you know, just having inevitability by creating tons and tons of tokens. Uh, I think Angel of Sanctions. It's better in this deck than it's been in any other deck thus far. Okay. It's it's a limited bomb. I'm sure you've won and lost many games to it when drafting and playing sealed. Yes. As have I. But uh, here in Constructed, it's it's starting to have some pretty big implications. I mean, we just saw it. You know, it's a sideboard all star yeah. in the finals of a pro tour. Very flexible. Uh, now you know people are five one at Grand Prix and five owing Magic Online leagues with Angel of Sanctions in their main deck. Uh, we could be seeing, uh, you know, a new mythic rare that uh, has some pretty powerful effects on the standard metagame. I mean, its major problem is that it's still just, you know, Glorybringer fodder. Yeah. But Glorybringer is getting less popular. Er, this weekend, I don't know if that's true. This weekend may be, you know, it returning to glory. <laughs> Let's take a look at Noah Walker versus Petr Sahurik here. 
we can see that it's teamer energy versus four color energy. So two very similar deck lists here. The four color deck traditionally runs almost all the same cards that the teamer energy does, but they trim a few of them in the middle to play cards like the Scarab God. Yeah, that's Maybe the big one. Maybe a Vraska one. or something like that. Yep. And my assumption would be that if I were to play this matchup, I would prefer to be in Petter's seat. Yeah, Scarab God is such a big trump mm -hmm. in the energy mirror. Uh, the fact that it has five toughness means that it, it, you know, it goes above and beyond Glorybringer, and it's really easy to untap with it as a result, and then you just take over the game by you know, using its activated ability over and over and over again. Whirler Virtuoso on turn three here for Petter. It matches the one from Noah. Noah's thinking about just running the bluff attack here, or maybe offering a trait. Yeah, he might have something like Magma Spray in hand, too. Okay. It is a dangerous attack, though, because if Petter just decides to, you know, activate his Whirler Virtuoso and double block, you find yourself in an awkward situation, even if you do have the Magma Spray. <laughs> like, yeah, you know what I think he actually has is a Harness Lightning as well. Okay. <coughs> And that, that makes more sense. Absolutely. But he's decided against using it at all on the Whirler Virtuoso. He'd prefer to just probably make some Thopters. All right, well, let's jump back over to our main match because they are just getting back underway and we don't want to miss anything on that side. <coughs> I'm going to see if this deck from Eric can, uh, you know, it, it was missing two really critical pieces of the puzzle for it. It really did draw, like, the bottom quarter of, of the deck. Yeah, no where, Anointed Procession, no right, Fumigate. Right, yeah. those are, like, the two cards that sort of make these strategies work, is that if you get Anointed Procession down and start and get any type of repeatable token maker, you can dominate. And that's a good way to recover from a Fumigate. And he just didn't have either. You needed more of these to champion it, which really helps you find those critical pieces. Yeah, it puts a lot of, of those uh, creatures into your graveyard, and then when you, know, you start embalming, you're getting multiple copies, and you know, it smooths out your draw, finds you the all-important Fumigate, the all-important Anointed Procession that you want so badly for a matchup like this. Steve, though, you know, it's post-board. He has access to a lot of new toys. I imagine there's going to be a counter magic from Steve, at least as an option. So Eric's going to once again discard the Sacred Cat to bring back a Sun Scourge champion here. Still got another one in his graveyard. And I like that play from Eric. I think a lot of people would have been tempted to just play Anointed Procession, which I believe he does have one of in hand. But uh, he recognizes that Steve is leaving back all that mana. And he says to himself, okay, I'm just going to play this champion. And then punished for it a bit. Yeah, I was going to say, not going to lie, I'd be pretty tempted to just play it. Yeah, I, I mean. Because, if, you know, if you get to untap and uh, do this... If that works, then you're way ahead. And if it doesn't, then you got to figure out something else you can do the turn after. Yeah, and here I imagine he has to play that annoying procession. Like, it's just... He's going to get double cat with it and everything. Oh, yeah. What? He passed. Huh. What, what costs one mana? Opt? That can't be it. What is this? Spell Pierce? Pierce? I don't know. Maybe he has a, another one in his hand and he wants to do double trouble or something? He like does one? have double spell pierce on okay. his sideboard. I mean, if I'm sitting there and I'm in Steve Rubin's seat, this is what's going through my head, right? I'm just going, wait a minute, what? Yeah, I'm, I'm really confused. And I think that, you know, the most likely conclusion I would come to is that my opponent forgot. Yes. But it's always hard to play the game as if your opponent had made a mistake. <laughs> It's generally not advisable. No, not at all. So 
So Steve's just going to do nothing. Yeah, and that's certainly not what you want to be doing when your opponent lands on annoying procession. No, so I guess it kind of worked for Eric. Maybe Steve's just out of gas, but... It looks like Steve kind of just has counter magic, which does not match up well against the uh, creatures that can make tokens out of the graveyard. Right, and bombing spells. Eternalized creatures don't care much about counter spells. Few of them they do. <laughs> yeah, but not the one Steve has. It's the pouncer. Ooh, so a Jorn pouncer that hits the graveyard off of. What was it? So disallow. Yeah, so it's funny because I just said wow. that there are some counters that counter, but not what Steve has, and I was completely wrong. He actually did exactly have it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is I was assuming that he it. brought in negates, but he actually does have straight up disallow. So thank you, Steve. Your timing was beautiful on that, you monster. That's so sick. That's a card I did not see coming. That yeah. is gross. I'm blindsided by that one. And once again, by the way, Hawkins has declined to bring back that cat. He'll want to bring back multiples here, but it's starting to add up. You know, if you bring back two of them, maybe you can start attacking with one, or maybe you tempt Steve into using his glory bringer to exert it, and then you take less damage. But Eric's at 14 now, and he's getting hit in the air pretty good by this glory bringer. So let's see what he finds here. And no attack from Servant means Steve wanted to keep up six, so he probably has Torrential Gear Hulk in hand. Wow. Which can flash back that disallow and prevent a pair of Doran Pouncers or whatever else Eric Hawkins wants to put back on the battlefield. Oh, he found the Fumigate, though, so we're going to see Torrential Gear Hulk for sure now. And this one, he's, our, he's very much on the ropes as Hawkins. Yeah. He's going to go down 11. to three here. Another glory bringer would do just fine. Yeah. He doesn't have <laughs> it. So, yeah, that would have just been the match. But instead, Hawkins is going to fall down to three. And have to hope that Steve's just out of gas here. And even then, oh, he does have another fumigate. And there's negate yeah. for Steve Rubin. Fumigate, no negate? No. Wow. Yes, negate. <laughs> Fume and negate. And uh, <laughs> that's the match going to Steve Rubin. Two games to zero with Teamer Energy. He was able to develop a board and then protect it, right? He went counterspell, torrential gear hook in a counterspell, counterspell to protect the uh, the eight power that he had on board and exact his revenge from that whatever Star City game match, <laughs> you know, yeah. over long ago. <laughs> and uh, well, you're not going to beat Steve Rubin that often. Disallow is a spicy meatball, though. Very I think much so. That, uh, he made me feel silly. Yeah, he only made me feel silly, too, because, you know, you think in your head, like, oh, well, you know, once he has that annoying procession on the battlefield, there's very little the opponent can do to interact yeah. with, you know, him embalming. But God, as it really turns gone. out, yeah. You know, he has one. He has one, too. Yeah, yeah he has one. one. Just the one. <laughs> <laughs> like, Steve, come on, man. You've got but that was the negate. perfect situation for it. Yeah. That was, it, you it know. It really was. He showed us why Disallow was there, because when I looked down and saw Disallow, I was like, huh. You know, like, is that, you know, is that really, is Disallow number one really better than Supreme Will number two in your sideboard? And he thought it was. The answer generally is probably no, but it certainly was here. Absolutely. And off of one Disallow in the deck, he got to cast it twice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, it did serious work for him as well. Oh, nice. So we're going to get to watch uh, Noah Walker play against uh, Petter here. I think we're actually going to watch that back match, Jake, the, uh, the one with uh, Chris Larson and, uh, and Alexander Hain. I think they may be and they may be going to a new new game where we can bring them over into our main match. The the one to the right that you see the players talking, that one is actually over, and Petr Sahurik was able to win that match. I'm going to assume two games to zero as well. Yeah, perhaps Scarab God trumping the uh, energy been. mirror. It could have been. I mean, th that is how you draw it up when you play the, the four-color version of that deck. Is, mm -hmm. you know, I'll, Standard 
all, it, you know, air quotes, eternalize your glory bringer or whatever in the game zone. Right? It's a, there's a, this interesting rock, paper, scissor pull between the versions of energy, right? Like the Pro Tour winning Sultai version of the deck that Seth had last week is actually not great against a classical teamer version of the deck. Whereas, you know, the, uh, the classical teamer version of the deck, while it has strengths against Seth's version of the deck, it has a pretty big weakness to this four-color version of the deck that, you know, gets to play with Scarab God and whatnot. But then the Scarab God version of the deck is actually weaker to the Sultai version of the deck because they can't afford to play as much spot removal and, you know, they can't really deal with the Windy Constrictor combos that end up happening on the other side of the table. So even though so much of the metagame is made up of these energy decks, they actually kind of like cannibalize each other because, you know, they create that sort of rock, paper, scissor amongst each other and choosing the right one for a particular weekend is so important. I think something that's also interesting for this weekend, though, is the, the re-rise of Fumigate. Like, Fumigate was not really so much of a card, uh, you know, more than a week ago. And last week at the Pro Tour, while Fumigate was a pretty big card, I think not nearly as big as it is this weekend. And if people are playing Fumigate, then suddenly versions of Energy that are playing more Planeswalkers, perhaps like the Channel Fireball version of the deck, where they played a whole bunch of Chandra's and Vraska Relic Seekers, those get a lot better because you don't get punished as hard when your opponent casts a card like Fumigate. It's just so interesting. <laughs> I think the standard metagame is really good. There's uh, a lot going on and you know, the innovation every week, just you know, seeing this blue white Eternalize deck, you know, it's just a completely different ball game. We tried to see a bunch of Fumigate last match, <laughs> but yeah. Eric didn't draw them in the first game and then had them countered in the second game. Yeah, yeah. One was but not But they would have been awesome in any, you know, <laughs> and they were really good in the second game. It's just that Steve had sideboarded appropriately and had the answer. But, you know, at any point in the first game, they would have been backbreaking. Definitely a card to keep your eye out on. Has seen a little bit of play here and there uh, since it's been printed, but now it's, you know. Yeah, I think Fumigate is coming it, back into its own. A little bit better now than it's really ever been. In previous iterations of Standard, there have been so many vehicles and planeswalkers being played that. Even though Fumigate on the surface lurks like, you know, a great five mana wrath effect. You know, you're gaining life. You're getting back into the game. This is exactly what you want to be doing. The problem is, is that your aggressive opponents, a good portion of their threats were vehicles that wouldn't even die to, ve to the Fumigate. A good portion of their threats were cards like Chandra Torch of Defiance or, you know, in the past, Kidding of Al Ally of Zendikar. And those cards didn't die to Fumigate. Now people aren't really playing as many Planeswalkers. Even teamer decks usually just have, you know, one Chandra, it, like sometimes two. And, you know, they're playing either one Sky Sovereign or no Sky Sovereigns. So suddenly Fumigate becomes a card that deals with, you know, all of your opponent's threats. And that's why Fumigate has become so good recently. Yeah, it's also funny that the token stacks can end up getting a bunch of extra life because their own tokens yeah. are part of what's getting killed. And that can add up as well because they usually can replace their board state in short order even a post-fumigate. Looks like the uh, raw intimidation factor of Alexander Hain has uh, sent Chris Larson crying in the corner. We have judges over there trying to convince him to come back and play. <laughs> and that uh, Alex, while certainly intimidating, isn't as mean as he looks. <laughs> so we'll see if we can't uh, coax, coax Chris back into the feature match area here. Oh, there he is. All right, look at that. He's got his courage. A little pep talk. He's a big guy. Well, he's big, and he's also in the military. <laughs> he's a sailor. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he's probably not super scared. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to him uh, b right before this match, actually, and I told him that uh, last week when I saw him on coverage, he had me in stitches. Mm. So I was laughing so hard. Mm -hmm. was like, in stitches? What does that mean? He's like, I could put you in stitches if <laughs> yeah, you want. He, he, he didn't understand the, yeah, the that turn is of a phrase. Weird, well, I don't need, what does yeah, that yeah. actually mean? It means you were laughing so hard. No, 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 right? I yeah, know, but, but what's the... I don't really know the origin of it, right. but, I, you know, he, in, English is not his native language, so he, he had never heard that term before. So he was in stitches. Did, did you see him pick up uh, <laughs> Seth? 
I did. That was my it, favorite it, moment of all coverage. Like, just... <laughs> It, 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 normally, the whole team picks somebody up and starts throwing them in the air. And not normally, but that does happen from time to time. With them, like te- <laughs> the team comes out, and Chris just picks up Seth all by himself I and know, starts chucking just him in the chucking air. him around like he's a doll. <laughs> it's weird because because Chris and I are roughly the same height, but like I think he could just break me in half. Like yeah, he's a strong <laughs> dude. <laughs> We always invite him to come play basketball, but secretly I'm like, yeah, if you didn't come, it probably wouldn't be the worst case. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have no idea if he can even play at all. Looks like they're starting to get to battle here. I see a some two drop there from Chris. All right, he's got a glint sleeve siphoner. It looks like 30, a 30, super player. producer Rashad Miller's been on the Square internet Square digging Square around Square for the stitches Square thing. Square. see so stitches in this scenario isn't referring to you know sewing it's the sharp localized pain on your sides that you get when you laugh really hard that's that's a stitch by the way just we've got the we'll update the names here in just a second that this is alexander hayne and chris larson but but uh you can see that we, we've talked Chris Larson back here. He's no longer intimidated. In fact, he's just put his creatures permanently in the red zone. He's just, <laughs> he's just fully encroaching on Steve Rubin's territory this here. This is my table. Sending a message. <laughs> and not Steve Rubin, excuse me, Alexander Hain. And, uh, yeah, he's just sending a message, you know, keeping him in check. It's always so obnoxious when both their creatures are Clint Steve Siphoners and they have enough energy. It's like he's going to be drawing extra cards. This is a post-boarded game. He's got a lot of removal. I don't like this at all. <laughs> By the way, both of these guys are undefeated. And look at this is interesting as well from Chris Larson. Four-color energy, but traditionally that deck will be heavily in teamer and then just flashing for black. But here we see the Glint Sleeve Siphoners, which, by the way, both just got killed. <laughs> uh, and, and those, you know, those are not always included. I think the you know if you're playing Clint Sleeve Siphoner, it's a pretty big tell that you don't have access to Glorybringer. Mm. Uh, Just too hard to make the mana work. Or? Yeah, you don't really want a double red card alongside your. Uh, and I think you basically just play red for Harness Lightning and Whirler Virtuoso. So. so Alex did have two removal spells for those Clint Sleeve Siphoners, and I know we talked about that, and that's super important in the postported game here where both people are you know stocking up on removal spells you can see though Larson still packing many of the cards that you see traditionally from the teamer deck including rogue refiner whirler virtuoso and we've got a bit of a standoff here both players at 18 Hain having burned his first two spells, both burn spells, literally, to, to kill the the two siphoners. And it looks like Hain is going to take a, make a move here and go for the uh, for the Virtuoso now. Yeah. Catching as much energy as he can. Christopher makes two Thopters there. Just, they're super relevant for racing purposes. Some of the better cards in these matchups. You know, the, the sky is so important when you're playing an energy mirror. So much so that last weekend we saw even Cartouche of Knowledge be a pretty powerful card at the Pro Tour. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. Nice little bit of technology there. I know there's a few players out in the field that are playing that here as well. That's something that I uh, expect to become more popular in coming weeks. It seems like one of the more exciting you know, angles we have in standard right now. All right, here's a Vizier, but it's doing what we saw it last time. It's just going to copy a Rogue Refiner. But uh, that looks pretty good here. Energy plus cards. Yeah, definitely a lot better in this situation. I think that, uh, you know, a big part about standard right now is passing the turn ahead on board mm. and just, like, finding a way to <coughs> engineer that. So... 
you know, that last match we sit, played, he played the Vizier, and even after copying that Rogue Refiner, he was just getting smashed in the following turn. By the way, here we go. This is a big play here from Christopher Larson <clears throat> in this four-color energy mirror. He's got Vraska Relic Seeker now, and he's going to just start plussing. Right now, the only pressure that she has on her is a Thopter token, and Chris has that covered in two different ways with two Thopters of his own. So this could be Vraska just off the chain and a major issue for Hain. Yeah, and it looks like Christopher even has a Vraska's Contempt in his hand, so... To further protect from things like Glorybringer or something? Or is Alex also not playing Glorybringer? No, he I does. He has two. Yeah. Alex is playing more of uh, the Channel Fireball-esque version of the deck, it looks like. Yeah, they both have the same name, but as we discussed, there's a difference when you're playing the Glint Sleeve Siphoners. Yeah, that... Uh, and how it affects your mana. It opens you up to being allowed to play cards like Vraska's Contempt, though, for example, which is... A, a nice addition to the deck in a lot of different post-board matchups. Pairings for round number one are now being posted. Players in the 5 p.m. sealed. We could see an ultimate on of Vraska Relics here. Easily, easily could see that. I've, I've not even been in the booth for, uh, you know, two hours today, and this might be my second Planeswalker ultimate of the weekend. What else did you see? Oh, we saw Chandra Shorge of Defiance go off. Oof. It was very exciting. Did the game end shortly thereafter? Yes. yes. <laughs> that is how you do that. I saw a tune with Ether, deal five damage. Larson's awesome. going to trade off a decent percentage of his board here to protect Vraska's uh, loyalty count. And it makes sense to do so. Though Alex now does have the, uh, the Vizier of Many Faces embalm if he'd like. No, he's going to go for the Scarab God. Big plays here from Alexander Hain. Really forcing the issue here on Larson and putting him in a tough spot. Certainly where you want a Vraska's Contempt. Yeah, that card matches up so well here. I mean, Alex will put back the Scarab God. You'll be able to continue to protect your Vraska. Now the thing that's interesting here for Christopher, though, is he may not necessarily want to kill the Scarab God because that will give him an opportunity to uh, protect this Vraska even if Alex has Glorybringer in hand. So Which with just one Thopter left would leave the shields down. Yeah, and I mean his Vraska would still be there with six loyalty so it would not be the end of the world for Christopher. But, but he's also letting Alex get an activation of the Scarab God in, in the case that he doesn't have Glorybringer. Exactly. So yeah, it, it's a big I, cost I, to pay. I imagine we're just going to see him contempt here main phase. Be surprised if he did not. There it is. With only one blue mana up, not much Alexander Hain can do. Dive down has uh, not quite made its way into these standard sideboards. We are in <laughs> game three, by the way. Spell Pierce, of course, not getting the job done there. So Chris Larson restabilizes with Vraska at a cool 10 loyalty and passes the turn back with a pretty cleanly stable board outside of that one threat that you mentioned the potential for a glory bringer vizier of many faces is going to come down and copy the rogue refiner again as alex is um, somewhat desperately looking for answers for vraska chris could untap an ultimate vraska yeah, and if, unless Alex has a Magma Spray. Which he just drew, by the way. Oh, okay. He also did get up to three energy now. But uh, the Pirate is a problem as well. Yeah, the Pirate having Menace. Exactly. It's an issue. And it looks like Larson is going to be safe here. He feels like the board is stable enough in his favor that he can just plus Frasca again. Oh, and he also has the Scarab God. Oh, boy. It's all coming up Chris Larson here in round number seven. Yeah. Inevitability this way and that. And even though Alex did find the uh, the Magma Spray that he wanted, it, it looks like it may just not be enough here as he's contending with two really of the most powerful cards in these decks. What does he have for two mana here? He's got a Harness Lightning to kill the Thopter and get a couple of energy. 
And he's going to make a foul throw of his own before untapping, though his board still looks woefully behind here. He's going to have to dedicate something to Vraska, but likely not enough. It's going to be hard because he, I think he, he needs a glory bringer this turn to not die in the following turn. And then, oh, okay. This will help. Chandra actually does help. He can plus Chandra, knock Vraska down to 10, and then attack with the Thopter. That would put Vraska at 9, which is outside of ultimate range. But he's actually going to use a combination of uh, Magma Spray and Chandra to permanently get rid of the opposing Scarab God, which also, of course, brings a blocker out of the way. But what are his, what are his attacks like here? It's they, that he doesn't have enough to take great. Vraska out of ultimate range. Yeah, not if Chris doesn't want that to happen. And with both those pirates having menace, it's a pretty big problem. Yeah, well, I think that Alex is just forcing him to trade off some of the pirates in this case. Mm-hmm. And it looks like that's what Chris is going to do. He can just go trade, 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 and leave Alex with just the Thopter. And with Vraska at 11, probably just plus Vraska again. Absolutely. I mean, you're under no pressure to ultimate it right away unless you're going to kill him that turn. Yeah, the downside, of course, to this from Chris's perspective is that Chandra still gets to stick around. Yeah, and that's going to be, you know, ticking down the Vraska's loyalty every turn. That's right. So, you know, if he would have left up a pirate, he may have been able to attack Chandra this turn instead. Oh, boy. How about another Scare of God from Chris Larson? And he's going to plus... This one doesn't go to 13, buddy. They yeah, yeah. Go. <laughs> and, I've seen uh, a lot of people look for 13s. Yeah. And that's a good place to be if you're Christopher Larson because he has another copy of the Scare of God. And there's really not much that Alex is going to be able to do from this position. Let's see what he finds, though. An island to knock Vraska down to 11, but she's still threatening that now lethal ultimate. And Alex needs something pretty special. Servant of the Conduit, no cards in hand, and he extends it because Christopher Larson says, I gotcha. Yeah. And he really, he was dominating that board on multiple metrics at that point. He had the ultimate to get the win the next turn, but failing that, he still had a solid backup plan with the Scarab God as well. And big smile from Christopher Larson as he takes it down and remains undefeated here at Grand Prix Atlanta. We'll be back with more coverage after these messages.